Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as I can see, this is a very popular panel, and uh, there couldn't be a better, uh, not just tribute to the power of the people on this panel, but also uh, to the understanding that I would say corporate India has of how the political balance of power has shifted uh, virtuously in India. Because our constitution was designed as a federal constitution where states were supposed to have lots of powers. It didn't happen for about 40 years uh, since independence. But last 20 years or so, that's been the uh, inexorable uh, movement. Our states have become more and more powerful. Uh, just, give to, just give you an example, there were times when under Article 356 of the Constitution, central government could dismiss almost any state government, even Jawaharlal Nehru used that. But to just give you an example, uh, Mrs. Gandhi, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, I have to specify, whose name is often invoked anytime we say we need tough governance in India. Uh, I have some figures. Uh, she dismissed elected gov state governments nine times between 1965 and 1969, when she was running a weak minority government. It became 21 times in the period 1975 and 1979. In less than five years, she dismissed 21 state governments. And then in the period between 75 and 79, uh, sorry, between 1980 and 1987, that law was used 18 times. State governments were dismissed. So state gov governments were at the mercy of the center. Uh, so either state governments were run by the same party that ruled at, ruled at the center, or they were not allowed to survive. Now that changed. Uh, all of you are aware of the Bomai judgment and many other cases. Plus, uh, because of the shift in political power in the country, no party had brute majorities at the center. So in the last 10 years, that power to dismiss an elected government or an elected assembly has been exercised only eight times. And of the eight also, four times in situations where it had become, an assembly had become untenable in small states like Jharkhand, uh, and twice in the state of Karnataka, which had a completely inconclusive verdict. So the power of the center now to dismiss a state government is a thing of the past. Uh, chief ministers have become very powerful. They look at their jobs very differently. Uh, they, in fact, have begun to see themselves more and more as CEOs of their states. Uh, I know yesterday's deliberations, many people complained about lack of decision making, slow decision making uh, at the central level, at the policy level. But really, what has kept India's growth still moving at 7% plus, even in a diff difficult year like this, when I heard somebody from Morgan Stanley say this morning that he believes that, Morgan Stanley believes that Europe has officially stepped into recession, and America could go that way to have another 7.5% 7, 7 growth here, is a good thing, but that's mainly happened because many of our states have got the momentum going. If you look at the data in India, uh, there are nine states whose human development index is lower than the national average. And the chief minister of one of those is sitting with me, uh, Mr. Chauhan. But all nine are improving their HDI index. All nine are coming closer to the national, uh, nas uh, to, to the national average. That's the big change in India. One good example of how chief ministers look at their role very differently. Uh, we have chief minister of Gujarat, who's not with us, uh, but who's just finished a tour of China. Now, there were times when a chief minister if he wanted to even meet a visiting foreign diplomat in his state, would, have to, would need the permission of Ministry of External Affairs, which is the most terrible of all bureaucracies in India. I know Navdeep is somewhere here, uh, head of uh, public diplomacy, uh, Navdeep Suri, in uh, MEA. But MEA would be really cussed. It would either take weeks giving you permission to meet a foreign diplomat or sometimes not give it at all and say things like, what's going on in this country? Chief ministers can't just meet foreign ambassadors, or unless one of ours is present. Now, Narendra Modi, who's chief minister of Gujarat, has gone to China, has had a very good tour, uh, it seems so, in spite of the fact, and the Chinese have invited him, in spite of the fact that the Americans won't even give him a visa. Uh, another example, uh, the governor of Xinjiang has been in India, which is the Chinese equivalent of a chief minister, again a powerful man, He's been fated in India. Uh, he's been hosted by state governments, including the state government of Gujarat. And Xinjiang is a province of China under which falls a large chunk of Indian territory, which we believe China has illegally occupied from us. Aksai Chin, uh, the Chinese treat as a part of China. And yet, the system has now become so open and 
federalism has become so strong that this chief minister to chief minister or chief minister to governor uh, interaction is now seen as, a, seen as a normal thing. Having said that, one of my panelists today uh, is the equivalent of chief minister of British Columbia uh, in, in Canada, and she's just finished a tour of China. Of China. That's right. And now she's doing a tour of India. And what's on her plate? Attracting investments, attracting tourists, setting up state-to-state -state linkages. My other panelists, everybody knows Mr. Prithviraj Chauhan. He was the star yesterday, and he's a star here. He's, in a way, the host of this conference here. My old friend, uh, sometimes we have the same taste in our waistcoats. He has the toughest job, the toughest chief minister's job, because not only is he the chief minister of the second largest state in India in terms of the number of seats it contributes to national parliament. After UP, most people don't realize it, after UP, Maharashtra is the second largest. He also runs a tough coalition go government. He has a tough coalition partner. But more than that, he's also held responsible for whatever happens or doesn't happen in the city of Bombay, which he doesn't directly control, because city of Bombay, as you heard yesterday, has a peculiar uh, arrangement. Uh, it doesn't have a mayor worth the name, and the chief minister doesn't have full power, so he has to answer all those questions, but he also is the guardian and patron of corporate India, because most of you work out of Bombay. Mr. Uman Chandi, uh, if you think the gentleman, his party colleague to his left has a tough job, he has the toughest one, because he has to bring about a turnaround in a state called Kerala. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was in Kerala once for a wedding. Uh, when, on an afternoon, Saddam, news came that Saddam Hussein had been hanged. Immediately, all of Kerala called a band. I think I was stopped somewhere in the middle of the road because my taxi driver said he will not drive. I don't think any part of the world had a band because Saddam Hussein had been hanged. So with great difficulty, I reached back Cochin. And, uh, and I borrowed a car and I drove to this little island on the, uh, at the other end of Cochin, which has, India, which has one of the world's oldest Jewish villages and one of the world's oldest standing synagogues. And I found the entire street was shut. So I talked to some people and I said, why should, you're Jews, why should you be mourning Saddam's death? So everybody said to me in Kerala, once somebody hears the word band, you all pull down shutters and you go home. And what happens in Kerala is that five years these guys are in power, five, guys the, five years the other guys come in power. And all the time, they are both competing uh, in Bandh culture. He's a leader who's been trying to contest it. He's also been trying to get investments from outside and convincing people that Kerala has now changed, and changed to the extent that Malayalis can, work, can be stellar workers, not just outside of Kerala, all over the world, but in Kerala as well. Mr. Chauhan uh, from the BJP, uh, it's the beauty of Indian democracy that we have a BJP leader and two Congress leaders and a Canadian leader. Uh, and I just reminded her that a very large number of her voters happen to be Indians as well. So she should know the mind of the Indians. Uh, Sh Shivraji has a, a very large state to manage, a state that's landlocked, uh, a state which has agriculture as the main source of its uh, economic wealth, but where agriculture in the past did not progress very well because Madhya Pradesh is not a river state. He, you know, his state doesn't get the benefit of the, uh, of the indo gangetic system of rivers. His, his, his irrigation is challenging. Uh, many other factors are challenging, but he has very enterprising farmers. You know, the soybean revolution in India has been brought about by his farmers. And he's doing many things now, lately. I complained to him in his last term that he did not focus on uh, in the industry. His growth rates were lower. He's now been lately focusing on industry and power. So we have all of them, uh, and we have a full hall. Let me start something. Uh, let me start first with the three Indians here. When was the last time the three of you, or any of you, had a dialogue like this? Chief ministers from diverse states together. Aap <laughs> I don't know, I wouldn't talk about this place, but we do uh, get to see each other in Delhi because there may be some media programs also. 
केंद्र सरकार की चुगली भी करते हैं कि हम सा, हमारे सारे प्रोजेक्ट्स दिल्ली में रुक जाते हैं कोई फाइल क्लियर नहीं होती है किसी को समझ नहीं आता है the ways of the central government as far as the clearing of files is concerned sometimes he may also have a similar complaint against the central government but we do certainly meet sometimes and and there are difficulties but the 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 way we try to resolve the crisis and the conflict that also we discuss with each other sometimes well, Shrekha, you yesterday i think demanded that three of your major projects in the city should be declared central projects do you sometimes have the same problem knock 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 but nobody is there no no in delhi uh, no fortunately for uh, cm of maharashtra uh, it's very easy to get uh, appointments in delhi and to get uh, central leadership to listen to our problems first of all maharashtra is a very large state and the fact that uh, it is ruled by the same party which uh, is in power in delhi is just incidental but uh, whatever problems we bring to the center uh, we get prompt attention not everything is redressed always but there is definitely uh, immediate attention and many problems uh, which had to be resolved by the federal government uh, they get attended to and we get a speedy resolution so i know complaints and uh, meetings like the national development council where all chief ministers <coughs> are members we meet we interact we listen to each other views and then we meet on the occasions when media calls us for giving some awards like uh, recently there was an occasion when all chief minister uh, of, of india were called together for some right. awards function so and but, we we are also on the but tell telephone. me something is it an advantage to be from the same party as the ruling party at the center or sometimes is it a disadvantage sometimes do you think if i was from the opposition i could scream more i could protest more now i can't so do you, do you, do you get the feeling you get taken for granted no i don't think there's any difference you know because uh, the leadership in delhi realizes Ev everybody is treated equally badly is it no i don't think <laughs> i think they all realize that if a chief minister of a state is going and uh, knocking at the doors of the union government it is to solve and redress the special problem of his or her state i mean we are only going for uh, redressing problems of our constituents our citizens of the state and notwithstanding uh, what political party we belong to some chief ministers and you know which ones uh, i mean without naming them uh, to make a politics out of it i mean they just make a political point out of uh, the fact that uh, center is not listening because uh, he or she belongs to a particular political party but by and large we get uh, patient hearing and the problems are redressed and uh, we have to do it quite often though but that's normal politics prithvi i mean if you if you were an opposition chief minister i know it's an if uh, you would use the same tactics well in a opposition will shout louder and you give uh, press conferences outside saying that <laughs> my problems have not been redressed but by and large i think uh, all states are treated equally mr clark does some of this happen in canada as well uh yes absolutely although canada is a much uh, more decentralized federation the rights and roles of the provinces are set out in the constitution very <coughs> clearly and the political parties are without exception separate provincially and federally so there's no congruency between the the party membership so i think that makes a difference in terms of just not just the way the law is written but the way the law the constitutional responsibilities are effectively carried out because it limits the federal government's responsibility to um to exert influence on the provinces in addition to that i lead um all the provinces all the provincial premiers this year at an organization we call the council of the federation we uh we come together a couple of times a year to cooperate jointly on on initiatives but also to make sure that we're asserting our rights in the context of our federation um with respect to the federal government to work together strategically to stand up for provincial uh, provincial interests and we have significant ability to do that because we control uh some of the most important economic levers in the country how are environmental clearances given for projects in your country uh, do provincial governments get permissions from the federal government 
or can provincial governments give those permissions directly? For economic projects? For, yes, environmental clearances for industrial projects. For most, for almost all approvals, it's entirely provincial. There's, there are some areas of overlap um, in, for some very large projects on environmental approvals, but the federal government is now working to devolve that or to work through a... To, to a, a, devolve that as one, well. So it's one project, one process that would principally be managed by, by provincial governments. What we want to do, what we're doing in British Columbia, is we're opening a major investments office where we will advocate for investors to get them from initial investment to operation as quickly as possible. So, Prithvi, uh, see, at least there, cent center can't, federal government can't give her a directive to register criminal cases against somebody and then clear a project. Well, uh, that's a thought. <laughs> I think it's unprecedented in India's history yeah. that, that a central government instructs a state government to file criminal cases. In fact, I have searched for uh, history. I haven't found any instances. And this is in writing. Well, I think uh, if you're referring to a particular case, I think uh, there I'm are... Referring to Lavasa. Yeah, there are examples. Uh, the, it's a central law which has been violated. And so, uh, about a law being violated, uh, some penal action is required. Now, who operates the process is incidental. But the, uh, let me push the envelope. Uh, the directive from the center doesn't say this is how the law has been violated and these are the violations. Mm. So, file cases for these violations. It's like... No, I think uh, there it, it, is... It, it, there is an arbitrariness to the action. I mean, let, let me again further push the envelope. If you were a non-Congress chief minister, you would not have accepted it. No, the point is uh, whether the environmental clearances should be given by federal government or like in Canada, should more and more authority be devolved to states is a debate we must carry on. Uh, I think uh, there is a new awareness about uh, need to protect environment. Uh, Canada is a large country. We have per capita availability of land is much lesser than Canada. Mm -hmm. The pressure of people is huge. And therefore, I think uh, what can go wrong with the population pressure, if you're not very, very careful, uh, could be disastrous. So I think we have to be extra careful. And ever since the new environmental laws were enacted in the 80s by Mrs. Indira Gandhi, we didn't take them very seriously. And their uh, violations galore. I think somebody has to call spade a spade, and Jairam Ramesh did that. But, but, but I I would like to say this, Shekharji, that when it comes to development and environment, we certainly have to establish a balance between the two. And when we talk of forest and environmental clearances, uh, you know, the, the states really have to sweat hard to get the environment clearance. So we have to build roads or to set up industry and the land that we have to give for setting up industries. And if coal blocks are allotted four years ago and, and you still have to, the matter still hangs between go and no go and sometimes you know the coal is not available the project is almost ready and i'm not saying this from a politic particular political ideological viewpoint i would not like to use this forum also for that but i would like to say that the projects do certainly get delayed and many ir irrigation projects could not be cleared because many of the environmental clearances did not come and i believe and every everyone believes that you certainly do need environment, but at the same time, you also do need development. And as long as you do not strike a correct, perfect balance between the two, you would not be able to achieve greater development and the welfare of the people. And therefore, we need to adopt a, a holistic view in this. And as far, secondly, as uh, she talked about Canada, the states do have uh, great rights there, and you certainly need to give rights to the states. But the, those certain rights have been given here, but those are quite few. And we are also concerned about our environment, like um, Madhya Pradesh is, uh, is uh, having large forests, but we need to protect the forests. The world uh, also benefits from these forests, but we suffer as a consequence because uh, developmental work does not take place in those areas, and we have to... Um, deposit greater fees with uh, the central government and the people also educate. For, uh, uh, yeah. the federal government compensating states who preserve large forests, for example, our hill states. Is something like that done in Canada? No. 
No. Or the equivalent of carbon credits for a state that preserves a lot of forest? No, no, it's not federally regulated. In, in British Columbia, uh, I'll give you an example on the environment. We have very high environmental standards across the country. But in British Columbia, we are the only jurisdiction in North America to have implemented a carbon tax. No one has followed us. We think that they may yet. We are, we are cooperating with the trans-border, um, with uh, Washington, Oregon, and California on working through um, cap and trade, uh, some cap and trade ideas. The rest of the country hasn't participated in that. We also have a 93 percent um, uh, limit or a requirement for clean energy across the province. We're a carbon neutral government. These are all things that we did as a provincial government um, and different provincial governments across the country are approaching it in their own way. Alberta's priced carbon from the oil sands and some of the other, um, some of the other uh, resources that they extract, but it's a, different, it's, not a, it's a different structure for a carbon tax. So every province has their own take on it and every province has taken it um, very, very seriously. The federal government, I think, is recognizing that they don't really <coughs> need to be in the business of environmental approvals to the extent that they are, because our environmental approval process has legislated timelines that we are required to meet for applicants. Um, and we have, we consider the economic, social, and environmental impacts of projects. So the standards are very high, but the process is very clear and the responsibility for it in the country um, is also very clearly at the provincial level. Before I come to Mr. Chandi with uh, the larger environmental question, uh, let me ask for a vote on this panel. We have four state CEOs or chief executives. Uh, is there a consensus that time has now come to trust the states more with protecting the environment? Uh, would you also want devol uh, devolvement of powers from the center to the states? I know you want it. आपने कहा कि केंद्र को राज्य को ज्यादा अधिकार देने चाहिए पर्यावरण की क्लीयरेंसेस के लिए सिर्फ केंद्र के पास नहीं रहने चाहिए ये तो कह ही रही हैं कि कनाडा में हो रहे हैं व्हाट अबाउट द टू ऑफ यू सी इन अ कंट्री लाइक इंडिया फेडरल कंट्री लाइक इंडिया इन द अंडरस्टैंडिंग बिटवीन द सेंटर एंड स्टेट्स इज अ मस्ट दैट ओनली स्ट्रेंथन द कॉन्फिडेंस ऑफ द पीपल we are getting full support from the central government. The last uh, UDF government time, then BJP was in power. But even then, we are getting support from the uh, BJP government that time. Right. This environmental clearance. In Kerala also, we are facing some issues. We are getting all the support from uh, the central, but Adirapalli hydroelectric project, we are not get clearance. So the, both the LDF government and now the UDF government want that project because of we need power. But at the same time, central government is very adamant because of the, there is some ground, no doubt. They are agreeing that uh, green bonuses they are allowing to state, they are promising to the state. So environmental clearance is uh, we have to discuss in a um, uh, merit basis. That is my opinion. Even now, when we are we are for this uh, project, but the central government is not given the chance. So, do you get frustrated sometimes? And see the see, because you've got you've got only five years because in Kerala governments change. See that both in in Kerala, see both the LDF and UDF wants the clearance from the central government for Adirapalli hydroelectric project. Even now we are pushing. But in all other matters, center is uh, very helpful to the state. But in this matter, they are very adamant because the environmental uh, circumstances are, is like that. They are now promising the green bonus for us. Right. So uh, now let's talk of the larger environment. Uh, you inherit a state after five years of very tough left rule, left rule by the last Stalinist in the world, uh, who's still a formidable leader of the opposition at the age of 88, 89, 88, thereabouts. Uh, is it, Stalin would be proud of him. Uh, how, do you, how do you turn things around from there? Because Kerala now has a culture 
explain to this audience a little bit about something that I heard that in Kerala, even if you give a contract for labor to somebody, the local mafia has to be paid the equivalent in wages anyway, whether they work or not. And you've been trying to question that, tech, uh, that practice. Just explain that a little bit to the rest of them. Many of them have run away from Kerala. Uh, in the, fact, if you, dri if, you, if you drive on that highway or whatever uh, goes for a highway between, uh, between uh, uh, Cochin and uh, Calicut, all, you see many factories, but all you see is red flags on those factories. And many of them have been shut for a very long time. Uh, but uh, and this is an old uh, history. Now the situation in Kerala has changed a lot, including the left parties. Trade no, but explain to them what you've been... I know you've been trying to fight this practice of collection. Yes, yes. How so, does it work? See, the Nokuguli, so without uh, doing anything, workers demanding wages, that is we are calling in Malayalam Nokuguli, without doing anything, uh, demanding wages. See, now we have decided to stop this system. All the political parties, including the left parties, all the trade unions, including the left trade unions, agree to this. And the government is uh, trying to implement that uh, in a very strong way. We are getting support from the public. We are getting support from all political parties and trade unions. The militancy of the trade unions and the workers in Kerala, that is an old history. Now the situation is changing, very fastly changing that situation. When we compare, compare with the, the All India average, if the working day is lost due to the workers' strike. Kerala is very minimized, very minimized. Now the working class, even the trade unions, uh, understanding the situation and they are very cooperative and the state government is very thankful to the trade union leadership and workers for that. At the same time, state government's responsibility is something high. We have to protect the proactive uh, workers' interest. So let me ask each one of you, starting with you, Mr. Chandi, what is the most important or challenging part of your job? Is it to keep the high command happy? Is it to keep the opposition at bay? Is it to keep dissidents in your own party in control? Or is it to just get your basic work done? Uh, for, uh, according to me, for these, these problems are not facing for me. The high command uh, is giving full support. And from my party getting, and the United Front, I am getting the full support. Even though the very thin majority, but uh, we are doing our activities in a democratic way. And I am uh, getting support in all, all quarters. His state government has the thinnest majority for any state government in India, in a totally polarized state, which has only, has only two coalitions. So it's a tough one. Prithvi? Well, I think... Uh, you, you have an additional factor, a, a coalition partner coalition. as well. Well, we have a coalition in central government and we have a coalition in my state, which are run uh, fairly effectively for uh, three terms now, and we've been voted back to power three times. Uh, well, I think this uh, talk about uh, keeping center happy, high command happy, is a lot of these uh, are uh, creations of the media hype. I mean, the central government will like the state government, which is ruled by the same party to be stable, progressive, and uh, make sure that the state returns in the federal elections the same party again. That's the primary objective uh, expected from a chief minister. We are responsible to our own people. And so I think uh, the challenges... But what, what uh, frustrates you most of all? At the end, I know you sleep very late. Uh, what frustrates you most of all at the end of the day? Day after day, you know, something that makes you do this. Well, well, two things, uh, that the right to information law which has been uh, with us since 2005 has uh, made everybody extremely cautious. The issues uh, that you raise in your newspaper every day, the so-called corruption scandals and scams that are emanating are not what happened last year or year before. These are situations and issues which happened long time back in the environment 
where decision makers thought that their advice, uh, their decisions will never be seen by the public. Suddenly we have a situation as if the rug has been pulled under the feet and suddenly whatever you decided 10, 15 years back is coming to light and it now is appearing that apparently some laws have been broken. Everybody is extremely cautious. Decision making has slowed down, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but I think it's a transition period. We are moving towards a much more transparent governance and that will give us huge dividends later on. It's a transition Ms. period. Ms. Clark, I'll break this order, but you will figure out why. So I'll first go to Mr. Chauhan. What makes Mr. Shivra Singh Chauhan most angry? I always try to be happy and remain in that mindset and always try to keep my people happy as well. And the importance of the development of Madhya Pradesh is the greatest challenge before me. And as you said that Madhya Pradesh was one such state which used to be called a Bimaru state, which is a diseased state. But now I'm glad to announce that we uh, our development uh, growth rate is reaching two digit. It is more than 10% now. And uh, we have uh, um, done many unique experiments uh, and, and people say that, people used to say that the people are only confined to the role of electing a government, but we have gone beyond that and made the people a participant in the process of development and, and, and we made them uh, uh, a very effective part of the panchayat, the mazdoor panchayat, the kisan panchayat, the mahila panchayat and, and, and these, these are all things that you've done very nicely but beyond, uh, other than this, what, what angers you more and that why am I not able to do this? What is it that angers you the most? Uh, see, one is that uh, uh, one problem that the political activists would always face that sometimes, you know, the false allegations that are hurled at you, you are doing a good job, still people try to pull your leg. So then, if, uh, for a moment, you know, you, you certainly feel sad, but, but are more of false allegations uh, hurled at you more by your own, uh, your, your own party leaders or by the Congress party, you may find out. But I am the happiest when it comes to my party workers. So uh, you, the, you, the greatest admirer of yours, you've sent her to the uh, state of UP, uh, Ms. Uma Bharti. She is like a sister for me and I respect her a lot. But we also have Mr. Digvijay Singh in our state. Uh, he is from the Congress party and he is supposed to be a national leader of the Congress party. He hails from my state. So he has also been sent to UP, the state of Uttar Pradesh. And, uh, and he has been given such a huge uh, task of playing World Cup with the team of Anna Hajare. So Digvijay Singh uh, has this fine art of repeating a lie hundred times then at least uh, people would start taking it as a truth. But if, if he hurls an allegation against me and if somebody asks me then I say that people don't trust him, his party uh, doesn't trust him and he also himself doesn't trust as to what he's saying. So that Do must not be Black taken I at its face value. Well fact to you <coughs> that India, although we say that uh, our politics is for old people, now some of our state leaders are very young. And in fact, uh, Shivraji is the youngest chief minister of a large state in India. Uh, second youngest being, uh, he's even younger than uh, Mayavati, uh, who always calls me her older brother. Or, and I never remind her that, you know, she's a couple of years older than me. But, <laughs> but he's, by far, he's by far the youngest. He's already in his second, se se second term. Ms. Clark, you've heard this. How much of it sounds familiar to you? A lot. A lot. <laughs> Democracy is a process of seeking consensus, and I, for me, whether or not I mean you're in a in a system that encourages or guarantees a minority, which I think you'll find in a lot of you know in, in states in India, or in a system in, in Canada where it's first past the post, the old British system, the same here, the same where here. you almost where you don't get minorities, <clears throat> you still build a coalition within your party, whether it's ex external or internal, and so um, you need to seek consensus. That's the nature of politics, and I think a lot of business people find that very frustrating because it means government is less nimble as a result. But that's the ugly reality of having a democracy, which I think is better than any other system out there, nonetheless. Um, I think, you know, for me, the thing that is most frustrating, and I've only got back into politics in the last um, year, is that you spend a preponderance of your time communicating what you're doing to the media and that eats, in, eats into the amount of time that you have to actually 
govern, do things, make decisions. And um, I, I think that's the most frustrating part of it. And maybe to put it simply to say that there's too much entertainment in politics now and not enough content. That, that sounds familiar <laughs> to everybody. <laughs> and how much a role does media play in that? I, th I, think, I think now politics has begun to threaten, uh, news of politics has begun to threaten entertainment TV in mm -hmm. our country. Mm -hmm. What's it like in yours? Well, I mean, I, we live next to the United States, the country that pioneered the two-second, three-second sound clip. Right. So we're, you know, we, that, that cuts down on content, the fact that TV drives debate, and the fact that we're in a 24-7 news cycle. Media um, companies that are bottom-line driven as opposed to content driven, I think all of that has contributed to, uh, to a less literate, discussion about the real issues that we face. And um, I think, you know, you look at the, the economic turmoil the world's encountering now, the discussion about that is, I, I don't think, deep enough. And I, and I think as a result, there's a low, uh, a low level of, of, uh, of public concern, particularly in my own country, about the impact that that could have on us because we've been relatively <clears throat> sheltered so far. So I think, I think uh, we need to move to a world where there's more content in media in general, and I think that would allow politicians to focus more on, so, on doing rather than communicating all the time. Uh, so, the, so the same question as I asked of all the others, what gets you really angry? Is, is, is it the opposition? Is it, is it the media? I know you've been at the sort of rough end of media's attentions over the last couple of weeks for purely personal reasons and unfair ones. Well, I used to be in the media. I had my own radio talk show for five You must five have a thick years. skin. Uh, yeah. Well, I, um, I, I think the thing that is, you know, I, I think it's easy for politicians to cast blame. And we make mistakes, we get blamed for it, and we try and say it wasn't our fault. I think that happens a lot. But I think equally, though, I do get frustrated at the, um, at the lack of depth in reporting. And I think reporters, media, members of the media, would very much like to be able to become experts in their areas, but they are less and less able to do so because of the economics of the media business and the fact that it's driven by television. And I think that's, you know, the, the, the fifth <clears throat> estate is a fundamental part of supporting any democracy. And we have to be very concerned or, as a society about, you know, the, about continuing to support the ability of the uh, press to fulfill its role. You know, one gap on this panel is that we don't have a woman chief minister from India. Yeah. Uh, some of our toughest, chief, strongest, and most powerful chief ministers are women. In fact, three of them, four of them for sure. Yeah. One from his party in Delhi, uh, but one in West Bengal, one in UP, and one in Tamil Nadu. Uh, so I would have liked to ask this question in their presence as well. But do you tell me, is it much tougher? Do you, uh, is, being a woman, do you particularly get targeted by the media and by the opposition in a certain way? You got targeted for your, for your dressing, I know, not long, long ago. Um, yes. Um, I, well, I think, yeah, I think that's true. I think women are, are still held to a different standard. I don't think it's any different in politics or corporate boardrooms. We're still working our way up. In Canada, we have a terrible record of women being successful in politics. It's just terrible. We're one of the worst in the, in, uh, in the, sort of the, in the developed world. And um, boy, it's, it, we, in Canada, we've just elected a woman on the west coast in British Columbia, a woman on the east coast in Newfoundland, and one in the north in Nunavut. And I say to all my premier, fellow male premiers, I say, we're not taken over, but we've got you surrounded. <laughs> Come back to uh, <coughs> states talking to states. I have many examples where I see states picking up good examples from other states and following them. And sometimes this cuts across party lines, and that's a very good sign in Indian politics. For example, Gujarat sent its officers to Andhra Pradesh to study the self-help groups there and microfinance schemes, and has implemented some of that in Gujarat. Uh, Chhattisgarh again sent people to Andhra to study the Indrama housing scheme. Uh, similarly, Chhattisgarh sent people to your state, to Kerala, to study the Kudumbashri uh, yes. scheme. Uh, I see that between Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat, there has been a lot of give and take. 
Uh, you have a Samadhan scheme where people can get their grievances answered online. And similarly, Gujarat has Swagat. So, ekne dusre se sikha hai. Is enough of that happening, or would you like to see more of that happening? Definitely. This is uh, very beneficial to the states. Uh, when I took charge, uh, immediately I sent my, our health minister to Andhra Pradesh to study the uh, health insurance scheme, Ayogya Sri, implemented in Andhra Pradesh. So we want to implement a uh, universal health insurance scheme in Kerala. Likewise, uh, we are uh, examining the progress of uh, Delhi-Bombay Industrial Corridor. We want to build an industrial corridor uh, between Kochi and Coimbatore. So the states will uh, definitely uh, look into the uh, best schemes, result-oriented schemes from the other states. Uh, the, uh, that is a, a very good model for the states. Shekha, a lot of uh, communications uh, between uh, states happen in today's uh, day because of uh, internet commu uh, communications. Uh, officers are just a phone call away. They meet in Delhi uh, when central government calls them for reviewing certain central government schemes. So this communication happens uh, on a regular basis. In special times, when there is an extra information is required, people do go to different states to have a face-to-face -face meeting. But best practices are adopted freely, openly. Credit is given where it is due. For example, Maharashtra has a unique distinction of uh, many of our initiatives got uh, adopted at the central level. For example, including NREG. Pardon me? Including NREG. Uh, including the Employment Guarantee Scheme, which was initiated in Maharashtra a long time back. We were first to enact the Right to Information Act, even before central government adopted it. Rajasthan was ahead of us. Uh, many of the things, Panchayat Raj initiatives came from here. The water conservation ideas came from here. So we are sharing freely what worked well, and we are also sharing what failed. Let, can I ask you a loaded question? Uh, in the last election campaign, Narendra Modi went from place to place in your state saying, see, Maharashtra has got left behind, and I used to be behind Maharashtra, see how far I've gone ahead. So Maharashtra should learn from me. Yeah, so is there anything you've learned from Gujarat? Well, it didn't work in case of Narendra Modi. But in in election campaign, it did not work. win. No, but, but is there anything, no, I are think there any, any good practices you learn from Gujarat? We are completely open to what has worked in even BJP ruled states. If something is good, something Because you're, lo you're losing some industrial projects to Gujarat. Pardon me? You are losing some industrial no, projects to Gujarat. I think manufacturing. Some, some major projects did go to Gujarat, but I, it's not for me to claim that every single industrial investment happening in this country should come to Maharashtra alone. It will go to other states also. There's a huge competition between states, which is good. Now, Gujarat has stolen much over other states in ports. Which we are a little behind in ports, and wherever port connectivity is required, yes, Gujarat has an advantage. But I think this is not right. If you look at the numbers, we are by far the most industrially advanced state, even if you compare with Gujarat. We just just far ahead. And uh, it's good luck if the industrial investment is going to neighboring states. We have no, no problem. I'm, we will continue to get the best investment. I'm persisting. Are there any good practices that you've asked your officers to pick up from Gujarat? That, you know, they seem to be doing this right. One I'll, of the top I'll think of is the water conservation program that Gujarat has uh, done. A lot of farm ponds that they make, lakhs and lakhs, hundreds of thousands for farm ponds they made. And the growth rate of Gujarat has been, uh, you know, of course, on a, based on a very low base. So we are trying to study if that is a good practice. Uh, we have sent officers there, they're studying it. We are open to uh, take uh, any good practice, whether from Madhya Pradesh or from Gujarat or from Kerala. Uh, what works there may not necessarily work in a different milieu here. <clears throat> but we are open and we are also offering and sending our officers to tell people what has worked here. Mr. Clark, does some of this happen in Canada? Do, you, do provinces learn from each other? Yes, yes. Provinces learn from each other. We compete with each other. Competition is good. And I think, um, you know, just as competition is good in the private sector, it's very good in the public sector as well. And I'll give you an example in British Columbia. Ten years ago, 
when my government took over, we looked at this province next door to us, Alberta, which was doing phenomenally well. They had the lowest marginal tax rates in the country. They had low debt, uh, low debt levels in government. They, had, um, they, were, they cleaned up the red tape. We looked at what they did. We met with them, talked to them about the economic miracle, and we did exactly the same thing. So now our taxes are lower than theirs at the marginal, you know, marginal tax rates. Our corporate taxes are low in North America. We've done the same thing, and we've seen the same economic. Em econ economists say if you lower taxes, government won't get any more money. Well, that's not true in Canada. Every province that's lowered taxes has seen a growth in revenue. Well, I hope, I hope that people are listening here because many bad ideas are floating again in our country <laughs> on taxation. Uh, so you now, you've been to Chandigarh, Amritsar, where the parents of many of your voters live, uh, and now Bombay. So when do we see chief ministers or your equivalent from other states in Canada coming into India because they are competing with you? I am leading all the premiers to, uh, to India in 2012. Uh -huh. We've invited the Prime Minister to come with us. We're not sure he's going to be able to attend. But um, I know, you know, Brad Wall, the Premier of Saskatchewan, was here a few months ago. India is at the very top of the radar screen for Canada right now, in particular British Columbia, Alberta and Saskatchewan, which produce 90% of the, the energy in the country and um, you know, the breadbasket of the country as well in terms of food. So we have some opportunities to build India. And I always say, Indians came to British Columbia 100 years ago and built British Columbia. It's our turn to help, through collaboration, build India. So what else is on your, on your radar screen besides getting a big Bollywood Awards Festival to come to Vancouver? <laughs> well, that would be great. Um, we also, well, it, we, we've been very focused on specific investments, specific large investments, clean technology. Um, we've been focused on uh, life sciences technology as well. Uh, obviously, uh, clean energy, LNG, we're building three <coughs> LNG plants in the north of the province by 2020. We've got some, and, and education is a big focus for us as well. University of British Columbia is uh, almost cracked the top 20 universities in the world. And so for, in terms of India's uh, requirements, with this huge population dividend of people under 25, we think Canada has a contribution to make that will benefit both our countries. So we've been me I've been meeting with uh, business leaders in Delhi and then today, uh, in Mumbai and then tomorrow in Bangalore about, uh, about trying to attract investment to British Columbia. <coughs> Shivraji, uh, 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 Shivraj have you ever hesitated uh, and, uh, you know, the felt hesitation in talking to a Congress ruled state also? No, I have never hesitated. I did send a team of officers to Andhra Pradesh also, like they've done commendable work in the field of water conservation. I sent a team to Gujarat and Bihar also. And I'm glad to uh, state that, uh, you know, I, uh, I have always uh, felt emboldened to sending teams to um, other states and I another good thing that I do is I send the best practices uh, um, uh, letters to other chief ministers also and uh, Ramdev ji and Anna Hajari have made a mention of that I have already enacted that law in the year 2010 uh, a year ago and I have already implemented that and I have also written a letter to all the chief ministers of other states of India that you also implement this and uh, about the Manrega wages issue uh, that it is uh, lower in the rural areas. I felt that if uh, that we should send the funds to uh, each household so that the uh, laborers get the wages in their house itself. So I started that, and uh, like uh, we are progressing a lot in the field of agriculture. And when it comes to giving subsidy directly in the accounts of the farmers, and of, also for the for ameliorating the lot of the laborers, and also for. And like my government also uh, prepared the scheme of Ladli Lakshmi, uh, which is for the female girl child. And, uh, you know, that uh, we, uh, I we in, uh, start contribute some questions in from the, the audience as we continue this conversation. Is there, anybody want, Adi, Mr. Adi Goldrich? Uh, my question is directed to each of the panelists. In terms of economic progress, would you consider putting economic decision making ahead of political considerations between parties in your country? Why don't you start? 
Me? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, I, I you, think... You, you have much cleaner politics, I believe, than ours. Less uh, messy. I, I think the answer has to be yes, because um, I, the, the, thing, the thing that citizens look to government to do is to provide economic opportunity. People want a safe, secure, environmentally sound community, but people need economic opportunity. And um, so I think ultimately, government needs to be focused on delivering results in the economy, and that will deliver election results at the end of the day. And you know, from my perspective, because I've worked in both the public and private sectors, I don't think you should get in politics if you don't have a goal of trying to deliver economic results. Because even if you lose, and you've done your best to try and deliver jobs and economic opportunity, you'll feel good about it. And there's no reason to be in politics because it's a really tough job if you don't feel good about what you're doing. Shivraji, what do you want to keep in mind? Shivraji, what would be priority in your viewpoint, the system or the politics, I think, for strengthening the economy and for economic reforms and for economic prosperity, politics never stands in the way of development in Madhya Pradesh uh, and whatever that I think is the best for economic prosperity, I do that and politics, I have never allowed politics to stand in the way. I think uh, it is the duty of the chief minister of the state to deliver economic benefit to the society. Politics is important. There are uh, political formations, the party machinery to fight elections and uh, to communicate the message uh, that the party's manifesto is being uh, implemented by the chief minister and the chief minister to tell the people at large that uh, the because they voted a particular party to power that he is delivering economic benefit. I think that is uh, absolutely essential. And uh, I'd like to also tell that there is a political benefit. Any state which has given good governance, clean governance, uh, they have been returned to power, many examples. We call it anti-incumbency when the government loses. But I don't think there is anything like anti-incumbency. It just, if you give bad governance, per people perceive to be a <clears throat> not a clean government, then people will vote it out. But if people see that reasonably good governance has been given by the chief minister, the party has been returned. Take, for example, the UPA government. Take, for example, the Maharashtra coalition, which has come to power third time in a row. So I think we have to concentrate on delivering economic benefits to the society. Well, I would only like to underline one fact that between 1989 and 1998, Indian politics was governed by the iron law of anti-incumbency. In that period, 77.5% of incumbents got defeated. That has now reversed to just 46% of the incumbents being defeated. So 54% incumbents are now being re-elected which means politicians are performing more and more because they know that if they perform, they can get re-elected. That's right. And that is what's given you this growth uh, over this period. Because if this had not happened, with any policies, any reform, you would not have had any growth. So that's a big positive change in yeah. Indian politics, which we curse all the time now. Uh, before I take the next question, uh, Mr. Chandi has to have with you. Mr. Chandi, tell me also, do you also feel hamstrung sometimes because Congress has a high command culture? Congress has a high command culture, and if I can be a little cheeky, BJP has a franchise culture. BJP high command is so weak that they franchise the states to strong leaders, and they run their own thing. So that makes his life less difficult. Uh, you know, his, his, as he said, his favorite sister has been banished to Uttar Pradesh to fight everybody's favorite sister there. But, <laughs> but do you sometimes feel hamstrung that your party has a high command culture, everything has to go for clearance? Uh, I have already mentioned that I, I, am, I am getting the full support from the ICAM and never I feel a difficult situation. I am worried only about, I am not worried about the opposition or uh, uh, media's criticism or anything. I am worried only about the development of my state, the needs of the uh, people. So we are working together for that objective. So uh, hand on the heart. You've never had a situation where you re really wanted to do something, but the high command stopped you, or your party's general secretary in charge of your state did not like it and gave you trouble? I can put my both hands in On my both heart. hearts. <laughs> <laughs> I never. 
<laughs> such a situation in Kerala. On which note, we'll take the next question. If you would introduce yourself, face. My name is Aspi Shukla. I'm president with Bendra Group. Uh, my question is very similar to what problem we face also in organizations, ki at what level decentralization should stop. If we take the subject of, uh, say, the subject which came up earlier, environmental clearances. Canada has an example that uh, most of it happens at the province level and not at the federal level. Large states may have a bona fide case if we take that analogy to next level, that should it happen at district level. A particular district in Kerala may want a project. A particular district of Orissa, MP or Maharashtra, people may not want that project. So then who should decide, center, state or a district level? Because that will be taking autonomy or power to people to next conclusion. Conceptual level perhaps, but this is something which I will ask all the panel members. Who wants to take it uh, first, Prithvi? Yeah, I think uh, uh, it's a good idea. Decentralization is generally a good idea. Uh, except uh, on environmental matters, we have a very bad track record. State governments have uh, by and large violated uh, environmental concerns because uh, if there is a mining project, the state government gets royalties out of mining. And they don't mind destroying forest. They wouldn't mind destroying wildlife if it gives economic benefit. Now, somebody has to make sure that countries' uh, flora and fauna, natural resources are not uh, completely destroyed. So I think till the environmental awareness uh, flows down to the last citizen of the country, which has not yet happened, I think we need a, a guiding hand of the federal government. Prithvi, I think his question is a uh, larger one. What he's saying is that while we recommend devolution of power from the center to the states, shouldn't there also be devolution of power from the state government to the districts? Well, I think we're already devolving power to a third tier of the governance in many things, in uh, developmental matters, in how we govern ourselves, in many subjects. Uh, but you also mentioned about environment, and that's why I specifically touched environment. There are certain uh, themes, for example, collecting of taxes. Most taxes are collected at federal government level. Uh, some taxes are collected at state government level, but almost nothing at the district or a county level or a lower level than that. But the fact is that our district level uh, democracy functions very poorly. Very few cities and districts have elected uh, bodies. How uh, is the situation in your state? Uh, you have the district. Uh, um, councils, Shekharji, I would like to say that ours is a very large state and development of devolution of power is a very good idea and sometimes the central government makes schemes and every state has different issues, different concerns and the situation in Kerala would be different from that of Madhya Pradesh. So I would say that when you prepare a scheme, you leave it to the state and, and you make state-specific um, schemes and uh, whatever that we need, we would do that because otherwise you you implement uh, schemes universally across the nation. Similarly, districts would have uh, different requirements like in uh, the state of uh, Maharashtra, Vidharbu would have different uh, situation as compared to that of Marathwada. So similarly, uh, in certain issues, you know, we should give pass to those different, uh, those districts in specific issues and for the development of uh, villages and districts, uh, uh, they should be allowed to decide and not the state. So therefore, the devolution of power from top to bottom is a need and I think we are doing it in certain cases. And um, like uh, if you have land okay, which is surplus, you China may, uh, you, 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 you yeah. may um, grow trees on that again. But like in China, it happens. Uh, and, uh, this will lead to anarchy in Kerala. No, no. A decentralized uh, administrative system we have already accepted. But we want more uh, economic uh, facilities. See that the uh, government of India now implemented so many flagship programs, very good programs, that will improve the uh, village uh, status and uh, facilities, no doubt. But at least some percentage uh, freedom will give it to the states. Likewise, state will give more freedom to the uh, local panchayats, district panchayats also. 
I strongly believe that will improve the situation. <coughs> and how is it like in Canada? Well, uh, it, it, I, it varies from country to country, obviously. I mean, an environment, a different issue in India. Because I think we, that basically we inherited the same system. Yes. The British, yes. Well, it, yeah, it is. Although, you know, in, in Canada, what we have seen, because we have very carefully observed the rights of the provinces, uh, versus the rights of the federal government, and the jurisdiction is very carefully laid out. What, uh, what we've seen is that we have liberated provincial economies to be able to do more for the country. And just as the state needs to liberate individuals to be entrepreneurial and innovate, and the state needs to get out of the way of the private sector, so does the federal government, the central government, need to get out of the way of the provinces and the province need to get out of the way of the cities. The challenge is always duplication. Right. So if you, you want to have, uh, you, you don't want to have a situation where every city has a different rule for plumbing or taxes or whatever. You want to have some consistency. Um, I mean, and so it's a fine balance to find and I think it varies country to country, but I really believe in principle the, the less central control you have, the more you liberate, in, you liberate innovation for individuals at the end of the day. And the country in your neighborhood sets a very difficult example where laws can vary from district to district. In one place, you, can have, you cannot have a gun. In another, you can have a cannon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And if you, don't, if you don't, in fact, if you don't have one, you are in trouble, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, I'll give you an example, though, like in Canada that's thorny for us, immigration. Immigration is a key driver of economic development and provinces need to have more control over it. But it's also very much in the national interest to be able to control immigration across the country. So we struggle with that about how we will divide the powers and who will have the control because we sure would like more immigrants in British Columbia. And we sure would like to be able to choose which kinds of immigrants from which countries uh, that we can have. I would like to be able to grant automatic citizenship to anybody who gets a PhD at a British fact, Columbia University. I, I, I'm, I'm interested that you say that because I, I was at a conference at Princeton just the day before yesterday and somebody complained that in America we drive out all our top rankers while the Canadians get the same guys to go in and a couple of million dollars in their banks as well. Yes. Well, it's, I mean, we have better, I think we have a better immigration policy than the United States in general, in Canada. Right. We've benefited from that, from that difference. And I think equally as America increasingly begins to look inward and become more protectionist, Canada is taking the opposite approach. We're playing offense instead of defense. I can, I can see that 240,000 Indian voters are not giving you that much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Before I take, uh, there's a question in the back, but before that, uh, Prithvi, uh, inevitable question, since we're talking about st districts and states, Bombay isn't quite a district, so you have a peculiar problem, because you have, uh, you have a city-state within a state, uh, and irrespective of what, what you achieve in Akola or Yavatmal or wherever, your performance will be judged by how people see Bombay. I mean, how concerned are you about the decline of Bombay? Because Bombay is in decline. Mm. Well, uh, the Population, if you look at the decadal growth, uh, population growth rate of Mumbai city, the island city of Mumbai, it has declined in the last 10 years, which shows that uh, the Bombay city has reached a saturation point. It's not that there are no jobs, but there are no uh, commensurate uh, living accommodation, social infrastructure. And we are concentrating on how to get the whole thing right. One of our major challenges is to get transportation infrastructure because uh, we can't expand like Delhi can or Calcutta can or other cities can. We are not, uh, by our environmental laws, not allowed to reclaim land in the city and uh, grow within the city like many other uh, cities of the world have done. So within the constraints that we have, can we build a ring road around Mumbai? Can you solve our housing problem innovatively by going up with public housing? Can you get permanent supply of clean drinking water to city of Bombay. These are the challenges which I call... But all your projects seem to be stuck on transportation in particular. No, they, they're, they're moving, but they're, they are see, trying to build a metro-like infrastructure or uh, a monorail infrastructure. Highly uh, dense population area is not easy at best of times. And we have uh, people, we are real people when you try to resettle people no, from what slums. Is, what about your, your, your continuing projects, for example, <clears throat> this, the, the second half of the sea link, 
your uh, other ceiling which has to come up between the island city and New no, Bombay. I'm There's happy, no movement. I'm happy to inform you that while the, the eastern ceiling, what you call the Trans Harbour Link, got stuck, we attempted uh, to go <coughs> with the public-private partnership twice and we, did, we <coughs> came out, uh, we were not successful. We are again restarting it. Within next week, the RFQ documents will be floated, and I'm sure that this time we'll get it right. It'll open a large hinterland area for Mumbai. Right, and what about the other ceiling from Bandra Varli? Well, that is, uh, th that is bid. The contract has been awarded. The contractor has to deliver the project. There are issues about uh, the yards which are required for keeping the... But can't you arm twist the contractor to start... Well, I mean, there's I mean, a limit. All chief ministers arm twist. There's a limit uh, in a democracy, free <coughs> willing democracy, how much you can arm twist people. And we don't want to do that. I think we're working very closely. But, but, you, to but you, you want that project to go on? Yes, we, we want uh, infrastructure of transportation is very crucial to growth of Mumbai. No, but specifically. We're also talking, let me complete. We're also talking about the suburban Mumbai district, which is growing. Right. And we're talking of a <coughs> much larger, a greater Mumbai area, the Mumbai metropolitan region which we are developing as a whole. And I think that will change the face I have of Mumbai. Two questioners waiting for a long time, the lady in the back there. Thank you. If uh, you would introduce yourself. Okay. I'm Nina Gill. I'm from SAS. And uh, I really wanted to ask a question about replication of projects and states learning from each other. I, I'm really heartened by all the comments made by the chief ministers here that they are, in, in fact, taking the initiative learning from each other. Chief Minister Chandy, you mentioned about the Aragoshri uh, pro project in Andhra Pradesh, which is something I have been involved in. <coughs> and what's in, the question? My question is that actually, often you are relying on the initiative of the chief ministers, that something needs to be more systematic. So I would like to ask, should there be some kind of innovation unit where, where, where you're addressing for, say, below poverty line people initiatives that <coughs> states could learn from each other? Should there be something available within the country so like, it doesn't like, rely like, on the initiative <coughs> of the like, like a think tank that all chief ministers share. Something that, like that, okay, or a unit, innovation unit, so right. you avoid the cost of reinvention, you avoid the cost of, you know, uh, replication. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take the last question, so we, uh, Naveen, uh, sir, we just have time for one more question. Naveen Raheja, you've been waiting for a long time. Uh, my question is, uh, as president of Na National Real Estate Development Council, Naredko, to all the chief ministers, Recently, we are framing a land acquisition and R&R &R bill. Has anybody given brains to it that to benefit 1% of the land owners, we are going to pass on four times payment of compensation to the land owners, which will get passed on to 99% of the population. Why don't you people stand up and explain this, that while you're going to benefit that one person land owners, the entire industry cost of production will go up, entire real estate will go I, up. I, in think the I, I think they've got, uh, our politicians understand land better than they understand anything else. So they've understood your question. Now we have two questions. One is a uh, question from the lady uh, that don't the chief ministers need, maybe they can be an innovation cell where best practices can be combined from all states, and new ideas can be generated, which all of you could share, and this could be, a, I presume, a non-partisan body. Uh, do you all think it's a good idea, or does somebody think it may not be a good idea? See, I welcome that idea. We, in, in our state, we have decided to prepare a plan for 2030, so 20 years uh, program. For that, we have uh, already started uh, inviting suggestions all over the uh, country. And uh, we have uh, already got uh, more than 22,000 uh, proposals. So, in, in, so India is a big country. So, so many good things are happening in other, other states, different parts of the countries. We must now get the benefit of the good schemes, good programs. So, this is a good idea. We have to 
uh, implement. Ms. Clark, you have something like that in Canada? No, we don't. There are a number of private sector think tanks or nonprofit think tanks, not funded by government, that do their best to share ideas, but it doesn't really exist in, in Canada. It's a great idea, very difficult to implement in, practi in practice. Shivraji? I think that is that this is a very good suggestion, but why only the chief ministers? There are people other than the chief ministers also there are, who can think good, and there are NGOs, there are other people, there are good groups, and we should take their uh, cooperation also and should form a cooperation like uh, what Raheja ji said, we should also consider that because we should remain close to the ground reality because sometimes uh, in view of the vote bank politics, we sometimes devise policies because of which uh, uh, we, we take drastic, uh, drastically different steps, though the farmers, the landowners should get a good uh, compensation, that's all right. But we should also give them, a, a generate a permanent source of uh, income for them by giving them meaningful uh, employment. And with your permission, I would also like to say another thing that there is an impediment in the, in the path of growth and development. And that is that every year, every second year, there are elections. Every political party has to prepare for fighting elections in some state or the other at different levels. And I have said this many a times that there, there is a need for amending the constitution that the states and the parliament should go to elections at a time in five years. And if any political party loses majority in a state that's or, that's or, that's or, that's or a, a parli national parliament... If you will buy that, will your party buy that? And, ...and elect another one, that's a radical proposition. But there sh uh, another thing is that uh, there is a, there should be an arrangement for state funding of elections because, because the costly elections lay the foundation of corrupt practices in the country because no I political think, candidate can ever fight elections from his own His state point. has the most expensive elections in the country right now, no, I, of not, which a lot of my media colleagues are great beneficiaries. I'm not sure about because that. Because they sell uh, new space as advertisements. Yeah. No, I think we got three or four ideas. Number one, in our state, uh, we have uh, initiatives uh, taken by district collectors, district officers, which we try to replicate throughout the state. And it worked very well. Uh, we have a think tank at the secretary's level, which we, we assist the chief minister with new ideas. And we're also open to uh, ideas that have worked uh, outside. About the land acquisition, yes, uh, it's a real worry whether the cost of land acquisition will go through the roof. But at the same time, we must admit, person whose land we take permanently away must get a means of livelihood. Uh, and we do not just give one time payment and uh, throw him away that resettlement of uh, families which are uprooted through development process must be complete before the project gets started. These two basic ideas are there. I have requested the Prime Minister to call a council of chief ministers to debate uh, the land acquisition bill. I think, um, I, think, I think the debate is still going on. So if the chief ministers meet because they control the land. You know, in India, land is controlled by the state. So I think this bill will yet go through a great deal of distillation. So I, I think, you know, I can see how much interest there is in talking to the chief ministers. Uh, we can go on and on, but if we go on and on, I will have a dart fired at me, and I have only one heart, Mr. Chandi, not two. <laughs> <laughs> it will come straight for it, and I'll be dead. So I think we have to, uh, I have to thank, thank the audience. You've been wonderful. I wish we could take more questions, but these, many of these people will be around, so please catch hold of them, and maybe I'll catch hold of Ms. Clark. I think we should take our screen awards to Vancouver this time. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sagar Gupta.